Hello everyone and welcome back to Average Nerd Talks. Now in the previous video, we looked at five reasons why Windows is not all that great anymore. So the five reasons that we talked about was one, the taskbar, which is not customizable anymore, which used to be in Windows 10 and before that. Uh, the second is the mandated online account requirement, which is requiring a Microsoft account when you actually install Windows. The third is pushing first party services. Now we talked about Microsoft Edge and uh, OneDrive. Bundled bloat, which is including software, which is not exactly very useful for most users. The fifth is data collection and telemetry, wherein they essentially mine your data to sell to advertisers, which begs the question, what alternatives do we actually have, right? So, well, I'll give you four alternatives and I'm sure you may have heard of some of these. One, well, the first alternative, it's not exactly an alternative, but it's um, a modified version of Windows. So there are ways and there are scripts which are available online, which allows you to modify Windows in order to remove all of this bloat and telemetry and all of that. And there's also a way to install Windows or set up Windows on your new Windows computer without having to input any Microsoft account details. So there is a, a guide available by PC Mag, which uh, details how you can install Windows on a PC without having to uh, enter your Microsoft account details. Now this applies if you've just bought a new computer and you're trying to set it up. Um, it also includes information on how you can switch to a local account, a local account meaning an account which only exists on your computer and it's not tied to any online Microsoft service. Uh, it, it also shows you how to do that if you have already set up your computer with a um, Microsoft account. Now there's a script uh, called the Windows uh, 11 dbloat script. It's available on GitHub for anyone to download. Um, there's a fairly detailed documentation on how you can use it. So there's an easy way to do it and there's uh, an advanced way to do it. So in case you want to change some of the stuff that it's removing or some of the stuff that it's keeping, then you can use this script to do whatever it is you want. There's also an easy way to use the script, which is again detailed in the documentation, uh, which should allow you to just basically run it and it'll take care of uh, removing all useless applications for you, disabling telemetry, removing Cortana and all of that. Um, there is a list of uh, the applications that it actually removes and the applications that it keeps and does not touch. So you should probably go through that once um, before you run it. Now, there's one thing you should note that is um, using this dbloat tool is not going to be permanent. It may be reverted every time Windows is updated. So the next time Windows pushes out an update and you have to restart your computer, everything that you removed might just come back. There's no guarantee. Oh, uh, it also doesn't remove Microsoft Edge. So you're kind of out of luck when it comes to that. Uh, OneDrive also will still sadly remain. There's no way to get rid of it right now. You still don't get Minesweeper though. You're still stuck with that old ad ridden pay per month subscription something based Minesweeper, which, you know, I mean, nobody really wants that. All the options after this are basically different operating systems that you can switch to. Right. If you're not okay doing this, then the steps that I showed you previously, wherein you can remove your Microsoft account, switch to a local account, and um, just use the deep load tool to deep load your system, and you should be fine. The only thing that you have to worry about is, you know, these apps just coming back every time you update your Windows computer. You kind of have to be prepared for that. So then, in those situations, you pretty much have to run the deep load utility every time your computer updates, which I mean, yeah, it's kind of annoying, but well, yeah. If, if you don't want to install a different operating system, that's pretty much the only option you got. Now, pretty much the most common alternative to Windows that you can talk about these days is Mac, right? So I don't see how Mac is a decent alternative to Windows, um, at least as far as the five points that we talked about in the previous video are concerned. Right, so if you look at number one, it's not customizable. Just like the taskbar isn't movable in Windows 11, 
the Mac, Mac doesn't really let you move things around or customize the interface all that much. So kind of defeats the purpose. Then you also have the mandated online account, which is kind of like a significant reason for moving away from Windows. Mac also requires you to have, uh, I think an Apple ID, is that what it's called? Yeah. It also pushes first party apps and services. So you're gonna have Safari, you're gonna have iCloud and all of the Apple ecosystem related stuff, iTunes and all of that, which you basically cannot remove. You can't remove Safari either. So it's no different from Edge. You can't remove Edge, you can't remove Safari. So I'll give Apple credit where credit is due. Macs typically don't come with a whole lot of unnecessary applications on it uh, when you buy a Mac. It usually comes with very sane applications, things which you would usually need like a web browser. Although it's Safari and you can't remove it, but hey, you know, you get basic stuff, but it doesn't really come with a whole lot of bloat and it doesn't slow the system down. Uh, data collection and telemetry, well, we have data collection and telemetry if it's any big, any big corporation, right? So. This In this case, you're just swapping out Microsoft for Apple, but they're still gonna be collecting your data, so there's nothing you can do to escape that as long as you're using a Mac. So I think the more significant caveat here is that switching to a Mac is a very, very expensive purchase. You're talking like thousands of dollars. You can probably get a Mac uh, used for maybe under a thousand, but then you're giving up a lot of you know, things like RAM or storage space or uh, processing power, maybe even battery life. So, I don't know, uh, for the amount of money that you have to pay for all of this, it's, I don't think it's really worth it. Of course, um, like you had OneDrive in Microsoft, uh, in Microsoft Windows, you have iCloud here, um, you had Edge in Windows, you have Safari here. It's all the same thing. It still collects your data, it's still not customizable and I don't, I don't see it. I don't see how it's a reasonable replacement for Windows. I think the only um, only claim that you can make is, okay, it's a lot more secure than Windows. It definitely is. Like it's harder to infect a Mac than it is to infect a Windows computer. It's a lot more locked down, but it is a lot more locked down. And it's absolutely atrocious at video games. So. Um, the most commonly used video game uh, graphics libraries are DirectX, OpenGL, and Vulkan. Now, if you don't know what these are, don't worry about it. All that means is that there's a, a bit of software on your computer which allows uh, video games to interact with it in order to you know, display graphics onto your monitor, right? Like to draw things on your monitor. Windows comes bundled with DirectX, Vulkan, and OpenGL. Uh, DirectX being Microsoft's proprietary um, rendering library and OpenGL and Vulkan being open source, right? Mac doesn't support any of these. Mac has its own graphics library called Metal and literally very, very few games actually support Metal. So if you're trying to use a Mac for gaming, you're kind of out of luck. So at that point, you might as well just use Windows, right? Now, the other option you have is Chrome OS. Now, a Chrome OS, again, is not very customizable. So if customizability was a thing where moving the taskbar is not allowed anymore, if that's a significant thing to you, then uh, no, it doesn't tick that box. Um, you also, again, need an online account. So in this case, now you're trading Microsoft or Apple with Google. Well, you still need an online account. It does push first party apps and services, but however, Google services and apps are typically ones that most people use. So you can argue that pushing these is not as egregious as say Microsoft pushing their services because most people don't use them. However, it's still, I think it's still egregious that they are pushing their own services and um, not allowing a whole lot of competition in that sphere. So um, Chrome OS typically um, uh, comes with uh, Google Chrome built in. It also comes with uh, YouTube, Gmail, Google Docs, Google Sheets, uh, well, the whole Google Office Suite, um, and a bunch of other few useful Google services which you typically use, maybe even Google Maps and stuff like that. Which is not exactly a bad thing because, you know, these are things we use pretty often. But again, still, like I said, it's still pushing first party services. So it's not exactly. <laughs> doing anything. Uh, now for bloat, I will give Google that as well. 
there is very little bloat on Chrome OS. It's only basically Google Chrome. It's an operating system which only gives you Google Chrome. All of these services that we talked about, they kind of open a Chrome tab and load the page there. So it's like uh, essentially just a browser. Your entire computer has just become a browser. So there is very little bloat and it's definitely not slow. It's, it's a very, very snappy system to use. Uh, data collection and telemetry, well, yeah, it's Google. What, what exactly are you expecting? It's still gonna collect everything. Now there's there's another caveat to um, Google uh, Google's Chrome OS that is well one of course you have to buy a Chrome OS device. You have to buy a Chromebook in order to use Chrome OS. There is a alternative. It's called Chrome OS uh, Flex, I believe. Uh, which you can download from Google's website and it allows you to install Chrome OS on literally any computer out there. Now this gives you the option to essentially replace Windows with Chrome OS and use that as your primary operating system. But there are a few caveats which you should be aware of. One is Microsoft Office does not work on Chrome OS whatsoever, okay? So if you're in some way reliant on Microsoft Office, then um, this is not gonna work for you. However, you do get access to Google's Office Suite um, and you can use Microsoft 365 online if you really need Microsoft Office and if that's enough for you. But if you need some of the uh, more advanced features which are only available on the installation of Microsoft Office on your computer, then you can add a luck there. Um, Adobe apps like Photoshop, Premiere Pro, uh, they don't work on Chrome OS. Um, also, if you're a gamer, yeah, it's got very poor support for video games as of now. However, I think uh, Google is making an honest effort uh, to improve gaming support on um, Chrome OS in general. It does support Android games though, so if you're into the Android gaming ecosystem, then you have that option. But if you're looking for PC games the way you can do it in Windows, yeah, you can add a lot there. Now the last option is uh, Linux. Now, of course, when you say Linux, um, I'm, Linux in itself is not an operating system. Linux is a kernel. I'm not gonna get into the details of what a kernel is, but uh, think of it like a foundation, which interacts with your hardware and um, gives your operating system a um, translator, so to speak, right? that can talk to your hardware. So a kernel is the basis or the foundation on which an operating system is built, right? So Windows, for example, uses the NT kernel. There's Windows NT, that's Microsoft's own kernel. Linux-based operating systems use the Linux kernel. So Linux in itself is a kernel. Uh, operating systems could be something like Ubuntu. You may have heard of that. Uh, there's Linux Mint. Hey, even Android, is using the Linux kernel, right? The operating, the Linux-based operating system that I typically recommend for most people is Linux Mint, especially if you're a beginner for uh, in, in Linux and you haven't ever used it before. Now, Linux Mint is fully customizable. You can entirely replace the interface that it comes with, although the default interface that it does come with is kind of similar to Windows. So if you're used to that, then yeah, all good. Uh, it doesn't need any online accounts for you to set it up, so there's no requirement for that. It doesn't push any first-party apps and services, so it comes with Firefox, which is not owned by Linux Mint, or, and LibreOffice. Um, it does have a few nifty add-ons, like for example, it's got a text editor, which is again made by the Linux Mint community. It's got um, a TV application, which allows you to watch IPTV legally on your computer and um, uh, some other very interesting applications. I think TimeShift is also owned by them. TimeShift is a backup software. Now, all of these are first party, but you can literally remove them all from the system if you don't want them and nobody's gonna stop you. Uh, there's very little bloat, as in typically the system comes with applications that you would need and it doesn't come with any ads or any kind of uh, you know applications that you cannot remove and of course, there's no data collection and telemetry because this uh, Linux Mint is not owned by a corporation that really needs your data. So 
you basically just install it, create a local account. There's no online connection required. You don't even need access to the internet. Although I would argue that's probably not something you should be doing because your operating system still needs to update itself, right? You do have updates when it comes to Linux. Security is also not something you need to be concerned about. Um, most of uh, the operating systems that I've talked about before, like Mac, Chrome, uh, and Linux, they are very, very secure. In fact, Linux is typically used in data centers, and if you use any kind of cloud service, yeah, it's most likely being hosted on a Linux-based server. You also have the other um, advantages that come with it, so it's completely free. You don't pay for anything. You can use your existing computer and just put Linux on it and it'll be fine. You don't have to buy it, you don't have to pay for anything. Uh, it's also very easy to install as compared to something like Chrome OS Flex, which is arguably easy to install, but it doesn't give you any advanced options if you want them. Linux, on the other hand, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but the installation is also very easy. In fact, it also gives you an option to install it alongside your Windows installation, so you can have both operating systems running on the same computer, which I think is kind of cool. It's also very stable, meaning that it's not prone to crashes and it's very consistent across different hardware. Now you may say that uh, Mac OS is also very stable. Yes, it is. Chrome OS is also very stable. Again, yes, it is. Windows is not very stable. I've had Windows 11 break on me way too many times with too many updates. I've also had that happen with Windows 10. So Linux Mint at least, does not have that problem. If it works on your hardware, it's running fine, it's gonna run fine throughout the rest of its lifetime. Now I know some of you who are Linux enthusiasts may probably say, you know, hey, there are way too many operating systems out there and why didn't you mention Fedora? Why didn't you mention Ubuntu? Why didn't you mention Pop OS? Look, there are a whole lot of Linux operating systems out there, okay? I'm not here to fight the distro war. I am just here to recommend an operating system that I think is good enough for most users, right? So I think Linux Mint is a great starting point. Once a user is more comfortable with using Linux Mint or Linux in general, then they can probably move to a different distro which probably suits their needs better at that point. So one of the most significant advantages of a Linux Mint or Linux-based operating systems is that it just runs on most hardware old or new. So like, you know, the whole Apple trademark as uh, it just works. Yeah, you, you kind of get that with Linux too. However, <laughs> I mean, there are some caveats to that, but yeah, I mean, for most cases, if you just install it on your computer, it should run. Now, gaming on Linux as compared to something like Mac or Chrome is actually quite great, right? But there are some caveats. So I'm gonna be honest here. There are caveats to gaming on Linux. Uh, so certain games which use very intrusive anti-cheat um, software, when I say intrusive, it means that they have complete access to your system and your hardware and everything, which, yeah, some of them do, but that's for another video. So games like Fortnite, uh, Call of Duty, uh, Valorant, and a few others, they don't work on Linux. Which begs the question, if these games implement anti-cheat in a way which is not secure, should you even be playing them on Windows? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Um, I might actually do a video on this, on why anti-cheat or modern anti-cheat is actually not very safe. Now, other games which have also which have anti-cheat, but non-intrusive anti-cheat, which don't mess with your operating system, do actually work on Linux. So um, Apex Legends works perfectly fine. Counter-Strike 2 works perfectly fine. Uh, Dota 2 also works fine. Um, Among Us, I've had Among Us work. So yeah, I mean, there are a bunch of games which pretty much just work without any problem. And uh, if you're looking at Steam games, especially anything on Steam, it's usually just install and play. Now there is a website called ProtonDB which gives you detailed information on whether and whether a game is supported on Linux or it's not. There's also a heroic launcher. So if you use Epic Games and you've got some games in your Epic Games library, then heroic launcher is the one you'd be using to run those. 
uh, GOG.com, that is goodoldgames.com. I don't think it's called Good Old Games anymore, it's just GOG. If you've bought anything from there, then Heroic also supports uh, GOG. And for those of you who use Discord for communication, Discord natively runs on Linux, so you don't really need to do anything else there. OBS also works perfectly fine on Linux. So if you're a streamer, you need streaming services for whatever reason, yeah, OBS works perfectly. Um, documentation for any of this is also very easy to find. So if you're using Linux Mint especially, if you come across any kind of problem, you can find documentation for it. Um, if you're an Office user, now Microsoft Office again does not support Linux. Like I mentioned previously, Microsoft Office is only available on Windows and Mac. So if you're using any Linux based operating system, Microsoft Office will not work. So then what are your alternatives? So of course you can use the whole Google suite because that's accessible from literally any browser. You can install Google Chrome, which is again natively supported on Linux. And then you can use that to use your Google Sheets or whatever and link those to you know, your you know, office uh, applications. Um, most Linux operating systems, including Linux Mint, also come with LibreOffice. LibreOffice is a free and open source um, office suite. Now, it's not as good as Microsoft Office, I'm gonna be honest with you, but if most of the things that you do are just word processing, so you like use um, Microsoft Word or you use um, Excel, most of this stuff already works. It's got a uh, PowerPoint alternative, but it's not that great. I have personally not used it all that much, but whatever little that I did use, I didn't enjoy it as, as much as I enjoyed Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, however, Google Slides is what I typically use uh, and it works just fine for most of the things that I need to do. Now, I know uh, Adobe applications also don't work, by the way, so you don't get Photoshop, you don't get uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, but PDFs do work. So I know uh, some people have this, uh, you know, doubt that, okay, so if Adobe applications don't work, then Adobe Reader doesn't work. Yes, Adobe Reader does not work but PDFs are natively supported in Linux Mint. They are natively supported in most Linux-based operating systems, so you don't have to worry about your PDFs opening at all. Um, if you are into video editing, yeah, sure, Adobe, uh, uh, Adobe, 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 I don't even know if it's Adobe or Adobe anymore. I don't know. Anyway, so Adobe Premiere Pro, it doesn't work on Linux, but Video editors like uh, DaVinci Resolve, um, Lightworks, which are both industry standard video editors do work in Linux and they are natively supported. So you can literally just download it off their website and use it on your computer. These are used by Hollywood and by film industries all over the world. So, you know, you get some of the best stuff out there even if you don't get Adobe, Adobe, Adobe Premiere Pro. Now, although Photoshop doesn't work, um, if I need to do any kind of photo editing, I use GIMP. Now, I am by no means a professional photo editor or a pro professional photographer. So, um, I don't know if GIMP is enough for whatever it is that you want to do. It does have a learning curve. The interface is very different from Photoshop. So, yeah, I mean, give it a shot and see if it actually works for you. If you're into vector graphics, then, I mean, you don't have Adobe Illustrator, but you do have Inkscape and you have Krita. Both of these are actually very popular vector graphics and drawing tools which are available on Linux, natively supported. And um, I actually know a few artists who use uh, Krita and Inkscape for a lot of their work. So you do have those options available to you. Now, if you're worried about your Zoom meetings, don't worry, Zoom is supported on Linux Mint as well. And so is Google Meets and so is Microsoft Teams which is kind of strange because Microsoft doesn't support a whole lot of other applications on Linux, mainly Microsoft Office. So, well, yeah, but Microsoft Teams, yeah, you have that. Now there's plenty of documentation online on how you can install Linux Mint on your computer. And um, I don't think there's any lack of help or any lack of support from the community. Now you have to remember that Linux Mint is, support, is a community supported operating system. It's free. So there's no company which is going to provide 24-7 uh, support the way Microsoft support is going to do or Apple support is going to do. So you are basically relying on the community. But that being said, 
the community is very very active so if at any point you do have trouble asking someone from the community using their forums or using their online chat is usually a very very good resource to get help as quickly as possible now there is a cost to going with uh, Linux based operating systems, especially, you know, open source and free operating systems. And you should be aware of this cost before you move into any of this. Linux distros typically tick all the boxes when it comes to freedom, right? So you get your freedom, but you have to pay for it. You have to earn it. So if you want true freedom, you have to fight a little bit for it, right? So some like, uh, previously mentioned, you know, Microsoft Office doesn't work, Adobe software doesn't work, and there's also a bunch of other software which doesn't quite work well on Linux, but because it was never really built with Linux in mind. The other factor is the learning curve, right? So if you're using a Windows system, you're used to the problems that come with it, the interface and everything that Windows does in the Windows way. If you move to a Linux-based operating system, it's not gonna work like Windows. I mean, you do have to give up something for that freedom because um, Microsoft being the most widely used operating system, you have to remember that most software that is written today is written for uh, Microsoft Windows. So things will change slowly if people actually do move to Linux, but as it stands, that's not exactly the case. Thank you everyone for watching and if you like this content, please leave a like, leave a comment below if you have anything to say about it. Make sure to hit subscribe if you like this content and if you wanna see more like it. Thank you everyone again for watching this video and I'll see you all again in the next one.